Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out today. Uh, of course, uh, here we are in Washington, D.C., um, waiting, I think, in between uh, 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 for, the, uh, for the next uh, uh, G20, uh, minutes, uh, uh, G20 meeting. Uh, we've had a number of important bilateral engagements that have been taking place between the United States and India. And uh, it is, of course, uh, uh, very exciting for us to be able to host uh, Amitabh Kant, uh, somebody that uh, we've been able to engage with, of course, uh, a number of times uh, in recent years as he's had a, a series of roles that really put him as one of the point people on U.S.-India relations, but of course now a uh, much more important role, uh, global in stature, uh, as the uh, India Sherpa to the G20 as India takes over the presidency. Um, just to remind everybody uh, for the CSIS event, uh, I am the designated security officer, so just in case something happens to go wrong, the lights go out or something like that, you can follow me outside the building and we'll wander around the corner over to the National Geographic Museum. Uh, and there we'll wait and uh, our boss, Dr. Hamry, says he'll promise he'll buy everybody ice cream if, if something like that takes place. Um, the world today is really kind of a, a mix of both threats and opportunities. Here in D.C., we're often uh, really kind of focused on what we consider uh, the big threats. Climate, war in Europe, uh, North Korean nuclear weapons, turmoil in Afghanistan, uh, always a lot on the agenda that tends to have us panicked and freaked out and thinking that the world is actually uh, in, a, in a very difficult place. But not everything is quite so gloomy. You've got a spike globally in literacy in recent years, improvements in infant mortality and economic opportunity, and India has certainly been the forefront of a lot of these, uh, these improvements that the world has really enjoyed. Um, Issues like these sometimes can feel like rich country versus poor country, developed versus developing, and a lot of challenges uh, that lie therein. Uh, India, in a lot of ways, encompasses both. You know, those of us that travel often, you're in the big cities, and it feels like an environment that is very akin to Western capitals, but then you get outside the cities or go to regional hubs, and you find that, you know, a lot of the challenges they face are, are a lot more similar to what you might find in, in developing markets. So India has got everything uh, to, to the absolute maximum. I'm sure India will leave a unique mark in its time as president of, of the, uh, the G20. Uh, that starts uh, just a little bit less than a month from now. The G20 itself was launched back in 1999, and uh, today it represents 80% of global GDP and 60% of the population. Uh, very excited to get a preview of what that presidency might look like, uh, hosting uh, my good friend uh, Amitabh Kant. Uh, what can I say about, uh, about Mr. Kant? Uh, if you've been lured to God's own country in India, um, you were called by uh, Amitabh Song, and the same for Incredible India. If you're manufacturing in India, uh, the Make in India campaign, uh, he was such an architect about all the, uh, the improvements in the business environment that have allowed companies to set up in much greater uh, capacity than they have been doing before, and most recently helping the, uh, the, the key government think tank, Niti Aayog, uh, think through uh, critical governance issues and uh, shaping engagement with India's estates. Uh, this summer taking the role as India Sherpa for the G20. Uh, Amitabh, thanks for joining us here today at CSIS, and the floor is yours. Great to hear some opening remarks, sir. Thanks, uh, Richard, for those uh, very kind words. Uh, truly delighted to be here with you, and uh, India takes over the presidency of G20 in uh, December this year. Uh, the challenge is that it's a very polarized and a fractured world, and uh, it's important that we are able to steer the world towards uh, growth because by the time India takes over the presidency, there will be recession in several parts of the world. And therefore, to my mind, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable growth will be very critical for the world. <coughs> Second important point is that um, uh, we never imagined that we'll all witness a pandemic during our lifetime. And the pandemic has impacted uh, vast segments of population. It's pushed people below poverty line. Uh, according to the United Nations, over 125 million people have gone below the poverty line. And uh, s close to about 75 million people have lost their job opportunities. So you need to uh, realize that the sustainable development goals actually have not progressed. They have, in fact, regressed. And therefore, it's incumbent upon the leadership of the world, the political leadership, the topmost leadership of the world, uh, to bring this center stage and then build up an action plan to really drive SDG and build up a financial action plan to accelerate the pace of SDG. I'm saying this <coughs> because 
G20 is critical, it's important, because it comprises of 85% of the global GDP, it comprises of about 80% of the global trade, it comprises of over two-thirds of the humanity, and uh, these are very, very important leaders. G20 is critical because it's not like United Nations. It's not an unwieldy body like United Nations. It's not an elitist body like G7. It comprises of both in emerging markets as well as developed market. <coughs> and therefore, and therefore to my mind this is a massive opportunity, <coughs> massive opportunity for emerging markets to work with the developed world together. And the other important thing to realize is that actually what is happening, it's important to discern this trend that the share of trade, the share of contribution of GDP from the emerging world is growing and expanding. The contribution of the developed world is shrinking, the contribution of the emerging markets is increasing, and therefore they need to work together for a better world of tomorrow. Well, that's, uh, that's great. I, I think one issue that um a lot of outside folks believe India is going to put its stamp on so strongly but because you've been so successfully domestically, is looking at the improvement of government service through digital programs. I wonder if you can talk about that sort of balancing act, though, because for somebody who studies change and reform in India, you've seen great programs launched domestically. At the same time, India faces a lot of digital security concerns. Bans on apps and things like that have been reaction. When you look at presidency of G20 and what you've done domestically, but then concerns that you've got globally about you know, actors that may not have everybody's best interest in mind. How do you look at G20 presidency for, for sort of uh, balancing these two things? You know, improvements domestically, but concerns internationally on, on digital. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Richard, what India has done is quite path-breaking in terms of digital transformation. Unlike the big tech of the United States, and unlike GDPR in Europe, which actually looked at privacy and therefore in some ways scuttled innovation, India built up a model of uh, digital public infrastructure where it built up public tracks. So the railway tracks are owned by the public, but we said that the private sector will innovate further. So you have in India, uh, the Aadhaar, which is the digital identity, and over 1.4 billion people in India have identity. All of them have bank accounts, and uh, the identity is linked to the bank account. And then we do fast payments in which all the banks are interlinked. And therefore we do close to about 7x uh, digital payments of what US and Europe do together. We do about 3x of what China does. Last year, we did about 48.6 billion real-time digital payments, which is about 42% of the total digital payments in the world. The next was China, with about 17 billion, which is about 15% of the total uh, world. So between 42% and 15% is the difference between India and China in terms of fast payment. But this has happened. This has happened because of the size and scale of what India did. 1.4 billion identity, everybody, 800 million smartphones, everybody using a smartphone to do digital transactions. I've not used my debit or credit card for over three years. The mobile is my bank and I use my mobile to do all my digital transactions. The only time I used my credit card was when I had to hire a Uber vehicle in San Francisco last year. But I've not used it. I've not been to an ATM machine for four years. So we all use our mobile to do all our digital transactions in India. And that is, to my mind, really transformational. But we've used this public platform in many other areas, like vaccination. We did two point, we've done about 2.5 billion vaccinations which is totally cashless and paperless. We provide health insurance to 500 million Indians, which is two and a half, which is almost about twice the population of the United States, which is totally cashless, paperless. You can be living in one part of India, traveling to another. You'll carry your digital insurance with you. So everything is digital. India has thrown up huge amount of data. It's many of its startups are solving problems for India. So payments led to then uh, credit, uh, many startups use this to 
provide cashless paperless credit many other startups actually get got into wealth management so you had startups like zeroda etc which started doing stock marking broking all digital paperless cashless and then you had many insurance companies uh, digit and aco all of them unicorns which now do end to end origination of insurance which is totally digital in nature because of the digital identity the digital identity is really the key which led to payment credit insurance wealth management all of them cascading on top of the other all of this driven by the private sector mm. well and let's let's put that to the other side then looking internationally which was the other part of my my sort of question you know um, here in the United States a lot of our digital companies you know they are global almost from day one and and frankly you know as you rightly pointed out you're much further along in, in your digital ecosystem domestically for healthcare and financial services. For the United States, a lot of our leading companies, you know, global, you think of the Facebooks and Googles and folks like that. For, for the companies that you're talking about, um, you know, is cross-border digital gonna be important for them next step? Is G20 a platform to talk about knitting our economies together more so, or is it really about those domestic lessons? You know, is, is this more of, you know, ring fence each country and create a better digital environment locally? Or is G20 going to be a place where we try to make sure that you can move electrons back and forth and, you know, uh, make apps and things like that more accessible for people uh, around the world? So nothing is uh, domestic in a globalized world. I mean, we must understand that we are part of a global supply chain. Everything is globalized. And we have to be an integral part of the supply chain. And therefore, data flows will happen. Uh, it, it's important. But data must belong to individual citizens. That's important to understand. They can't be owned by Meta or they can't be owned by Google. Data, when we brought out the data empowerment protection architecture, we said that the data belongs to the individual. And that is critical to understand. And therefore, it's up to the individual to do what he wants to do with the data. Allow data flows to take place in a transparent, competitive manner. There's no issue at, on commercial data at all. And therefore, India, really, when it came out with the data protection bill, it realized it realized after parliamentary discussion that it had too many constraints. So it scrapped that and it's coming out with a far more uh, progressive uh, bill which will come out into the market, uh, which will come out in public domain shortly. Oh, good, good. Um, you know, as a few of us gathered just before this event, um, you know, I think uh, probably 75% of the questions that came up were related to climate. Uh, clearly, again, you've got a COP summit on the horizon. There's a number of forums now, including the Quad where we do have conversations bilaterally, multilaterally. How does the G20 fit in when you think about climate? What is the role of G20 versus all these other sort of platforms? And are there particular agenda items related to climate change that you think the G20 is uh, purpose built for or that you think is going to be sort of dominating, you know, the agenda as you begin to write it? Uh, so first and foremost, uh, climate change and energy transition are two sides of the same coin. Hmm. It's important to understand this. And you can't have energy transition uh, without talking about climate action, and you can't have climate action without energy transition. They're two sides of the same coin. Uh, climate action will continue to be discussed in all global bodies because it's the key issue before the world. It's not possible to grow without decarbonizing the world. It's a huge opportunity for the world. It's not a challenge. India has been very, very aggressive, despite the fact that India has not contributed uh, to uh, carbonizing the world. It's the developed world which has actually contributed to carbonizing the world. If you look at the total carbon space available uh, for at 1.5 degrees centigrade, that's 2,400 gigatons of carbon space, 80 Eight, 90 percent of it is occupied by the developed world. When they were industrializing, they carbonized the world. And therefore, all the carbon space has been taken by them. And therefore, the principle that was ex ex uh, accepted in COP was that there will be climate justice. And f to allow the developed, because if India is developing now, the challenge for India is to become the first country in the world to industrialize without carbonizing. That is the challenge before India. Now, if it has to industrialize without carbonizing, what does it need to do? To my mind, there are two things only. One is to ensure that you are able to get the most advanced technology to leapfrog. Second is to get that advanced technology, you need funding at low interest rates, without which it will not happen. 
Now, both these areas, the developed countries from 2009 onwards, which they committed to at Copenhagen, 100 billion a year, none of the developed countries have lived up to it. And the developed world from COP1 to COP26 has not lived up to its commitments. So, I think there is a clear need for the developed world to live up to its commitments with regards to that. But irrespective of that, India and Indian companies view climate action as absolutely a great opportunity. We will technologically leapfrog in these areas. We've demonstrated this in the field of renewable. We're doing about 120 gigawatt. We'll demonstrate this in green hydrogen as well. But it's necessary to have progressive policies which allow green hydrogen to be manufactured at the lowest cost across the world and not be protectionist about it. Well, I have to touch on, of course, my, my favorite topic and one that you've been such a driver of, which is you know, looking at uh, subnational as well. Um, you know, heard the prime minister recently in India talking about you know the the uh, the interest in, in engaging state governments in India. It's not just an India issue, of course. I mean, many countries, including the United States, we focus a lot on national government, but but actually, so much action is actually driven by local government, states, and, and others. Um, how, how is India thinking about this? About engaging state governments? Do do you find that a lot of state governments, you know, they think of G20 presidency as an opportunity, or is it low priority for what states are dealing with, with all the, the issues that are kind of on the table there. But how, how do you engage and what are the topics you think that states in India are going to be most reactive to and maybe some lessons that the rest of us can learn from that? So, um, uh, Richard, one is that India is a very large country. We are bigger than 25 countries of Europe. So much of the action is now in the states. It's not at the center. The centers carried out a lot of reforms. How do you push the states? How do you push the state? So one of the key things is really about uh, taking real-time data, uh, ranking states on performance. So we did this on ease of doing business. We started ranking states. The first year we did this, Gujarat came number one. The second year we did this, Andhra beat Gujarat. The third year, Telangana beat Andhra and Gujarat. But the good thing was that the uh, states in the eastern part of India, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, which were 24th and 25th, they jumped up to 4th and 5th position. So we started ranking states on SDGs, on education, on health, on water. And I think that's pushing them to accelerate the pace of change. We ran another program called the Aspirational District Program, covering about 115 of the most backward districts of India. We don't call them backward, we call them aspirational. Where a transformation happened on the basis of real-time data, real-time data, putting that data in public domain, ranking, naming and shaming them. So data for development was very, very critical. And states and, uh, will play a very key role. The important thing is that you need about 10 to 12 states in India to really drive growth of India at very double-digit rates. Yeah. Well, I wonder if you can, again, take in that and applying those lessons. I mean, for G20, what, what does the G20 mean for states? Obviously, a beacon in some of the things you pointed to on how the national government can, can work with states, engage states, <coughs> you know, sometimes provoke states. Um, how do states play into the G20 agenda? Is it simply, you know, looking at different states to host different parts of the G20 agenda, bringing delegations out there and things? Is there going to be formal platforms to engage state governments and, and bring them into the agenda? So how, how does G20 specifically kind of overlap with uh, states' engagement? So we have over 200 events. They are being held in 55 cities across every state and union territory. So G20 is not about holding it in the capital of uh, India. It's about taking it into different parts of India. So every state is actually a partner into the G20 movement. They're all becoming an active player into the G20 movement. And therefore, uh, the G20 is not about just uh, the leadership in Delhi hosting it. It's about the citizens of India hosting G20. Yeah. Um, I've got uh, one more that I had in my mind, but uh, we've got a microphone set up right over on the side of the room there. So if uh, anybody in the room has a question that they want to, uh, that they want to tee up, um, please just go ahead and queue up in front of the, uh, the microphone, and we'll make sure that we, uh, we get to your questions as well. Um, one that did not come up um, in, in kind of our pre-meet, but uh, looking, at, uh, looking at healthcare. It's been you know, part of Indonesia's uh, priority, and it's been on the G20 agenda. You know, I think as we get together in person for an event like this, we, we consider ourselves almost uh, you know, in the post-COVID environment. But you know, in fact, uh, with a new variant or whatever, we might be still early COVID or mid-COVID. We don't know. How, how does, when you think about the healthcare agenda, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the G20, um, and, and coming out of the pandemic, hopefully coming out of the pandemic, 
Um, what, what does the agenda for you look like? You mentioned some of the great work that India has done domestically on digitization of healthcare, but are there other big topics? Is it preparing for another wave of the pandemic? Is it the next thing that might come down the pike? Uh, I'm just wondering how you think about that important provision. So one, a uh, lot of action on this was taken in uh, Indonesia's presidency, one of which was to create a fund which would then uh, be housed in the World Bank for which all countries are funded, G20 members are funded, to confront the pandemic of tomorrow. So if there is a second pandemic tomorrow, there would be resources available, which could then be used for vaccinations, for drugs, research and development, and so on, and which could be moved immediately, and all many countries have contributed to it. So that's the facility created by the G20 in the World Bank right now. So that's one which really pushes and accelerates the process of R&D and vaccination. The second is to uh, really uh, prepare an action plan for improving health outcomes. And that would require a lot of primary health care. That would require an action plan for primary health care across the world. There's a challenge on the insurance side. Many of these issues are under discussion at, in the health working track of uh, the G20. Hmm. Do, do you think that you know, cooperation between developing and developing, developed and developing, you mentioned you know, some of the challenges in those spaces and climate and other areas. Has healthcare has been a little bit better? Is G20 a place to try to bridge some of those differences for cooperation? Or do you think that cooperation was about as good as it can be during time of crisis? So Richard, one thing that I've seen uh, cooperation happening in all areas of uh, whether it's climate, whether it's SDG, whether it's health, whether it's technology, all these areas, broad consensus is arrived at. Everyone arrives at a consensus on all developmental issues. The challenge has been the geopolitics. The challenge has been the Russia-Ukraine war, on which you've had a scenario where G7 is not willing to sit with Russia, or you've had a situation where there's no family photograph. So those are issues. There's a, there is a genuine challenge, so it's better to talk about it. As far as that particular issue is concerned, Concerned, but I think the world has evolved. Uh, world is evolving, and therefore you need. It's the important thing to understand that G20 is not about just communiques. You know, many academicians like you start looking at issue notes, communique, what communique was issued. It's about the personal networking of leaders. Global challenges, global problems are solved when leaders are able to sit and discuss. They are political leaders of the world's largest countries. And therefore, political leaders have to find solutions to the political challenges of the world. It can't be done at a bureaucratic level. It has to be done by global leaders who really take leadership head on. So action is more important than communiques. All right, I'll take that away. And uh, <laughs> I think in think tank land, we do get wrapped up in, in communiques and parsing out the language in there, um, and maybe a little bit less in terms of what happens after the fact. So, uh, so it's a good point. Yeah. Um, I see we've got a few people uh, queued up already on the side there. So uh, we can, if you don't mind uh, letting us know uh, who you are, the organization you represent, and uh, you know, make a relatively quick uh, point or question if you can. Um, my name is Gaurav. I'm a student at Georgetown University, and I'm also interning with the Asia Society here in DC, which is a think tank. Thanks so much for taking out the time to speak with us, Mr. Kant. Um, my question is with regard to uh, the reform of international institutions. At MC12, uh, it was agreed upon that uh, consultations would begin for WTO reform, and uh, there would be an effort to uh, close them by 2024. In that context, since India is assuming presidency and since India is looked at as a leader in the developing world and as an uh, emerging power, uh, what, what, uh, where, where do you, what do you think are India's priorities in terms of um, getting some, uh, some actual actionable uh, uh, elements of reform uh, passed through at least the G20 members, if not uh, internationally? So India's uh, leadership has been talking about the needs for a post uh, Bretton Wood uh, multilateral institutions for the 21st century for a long time. It's absolutely necessary. There's uh, one part of it, which is the structural changes, the quota, etc., cetera, uh, bringing other members into the Security Council. That's one part of it. Uh, uh, you know, that's uh, structural in nature. And uh, that's an ongoing process, which we're talking about. That relates to the United Nations. Uh, Second is that you have the post-Britain Wood period institutions like World Bank, 
uh, and IMF. And thirdly, you have institutions like WTO, WHO, etc. So there are three different forms of institutions. When we're talking about multilateral institutions for the 21st century, all of them need to change and evolve. Uh, the United Nations of of course, because the emerging markets have grown in size and scale, so they need to find a place on decision-making. Global decision-making can't be uh, shifted to one place. India has become the fifth largest country in the world. Economically, it will become the third largest country in the world. Uh, the World War II uh, scenario has totally radically changed since then, so the Security Council itself needs to be structured. But I think, to my mind, the most important thing is that uh, IMF and World Bank, they need to do far more lending on climate action and an SDG, they need to become institutions for driving climate action. And that would mean that instead of doing direct lending, they do credit enhancement, first loss guarantees, blended finance, which will enable you to do 20x lending of what you're doing right now. And that's very, very important. Great. Uh, Katie? Thank you, Mr. Kant. Um, I'm Katie O'Gara from the Climate and Land Use Alliance, which is an alliance of philanthropy organizations. Um, you've talked about climate action and what's needed and a bit about energy um, and the digital transformation. But India also has a lot of potential on the land use side in terms of agriculture, forestry, mangroves, other land uses, not only for uh, carbon sequestration and mitigation, but also on adaptation. And there's a lot of potential for land use to support a just transition for climate change um, in terms of the rights and well-being of people as well. And so I was wondering if you see this issue um, in terms of restoration, regenerative agriculture, or any other land use issues related to climate coming up at G20. No, it's an important issue. The subject of agriculture uh, will be discussed at great length. India is itself pushing for natural farming in a very big way. It is pushing for millets. It's pushing for crops which have uh, which are less water consuming. And agriculture will be a very major subject of discussion in the agriculture working group. Many of these areas, health, agriculture, etc., they have specific working groups which will discuss this, lay out the agenda, and some of it will come before the leaders' uh, final communique. Great. Hi, my name is Smithy. I'm from Johns Hopkins SICE. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, today my question is about, um, you know, cooperation on development goals com considering uh, competing interests. Um, I mean, India has said that, you know, the world is a family, but realistically there's a lot of conflict and personal, you know, uh, interests are coming in the way. So, um, you know, especially in light of the Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, conflict and uh, competing interests with China, how does India aim to facilitate cooperation for development um, and, you know, keeping in mind these different, you know, political styles uh, and leadership styles? So you've, uh, in your question, you've raised all the, ch all the challenges. And that's why you have G20 leadership, which is able to sit together and find an answer to some of these development cooperation, particularly SDG challenges. Uh, you need a completely new action plan. You need a completely new financial action plan. And that's what the G20 should do uh, during uh, the India leadership, uh, in, during the, uh, India's presidency. And I think they need to discuss this thoroughly. Um, that's what we'll work towards, particularly in the area of education. Yeah, great. Uh, good morning, Eric Pulaski from the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, it sounded like uh, in some of your comments about the IMF and the World Bank, you were reading from the Capital Adequacy Framework Review, which is obviously a great thing. Um, so thank you for your comments about that. I wondered in particular whether you have a view about um, the callable capital proposal that's in that um, uh, review by the commission. So that's an issue still under, that's an important issue, it's still under debate and discussion in the finance track. And uh, there's a lot of discussion going on under that, in, not in the Sherpa track, but in the 
central in the finance track with the finance ministers right now and a final discussion will take place at Bali and in subsequent meetings in India. But it's, it's really, when you're talking about that, you're talking about really a process of restructuring these institutions. So both have to be accompanied together. Call for capital, quotas, restructuring, so that you have great amount of capital. But my view on that is that that may be a long-term reform, but in the short-term reform, uh, within, within these institutions, why don't you convert them into institutions for climate finance? It, just to follow up for one finger, it, um, it, it seems to me that if one doesn't embark on that, then the, the outcomes could be very incremental and fall short of you, what I would think India's yeah, yeah, ambitions yeah. are. No, no, you're right. So that process, it's, it's a very hotly debated issue. So that is under discussion uh, right now in the finance track. Thank you. Sir. Thanks. Yeah, Brad. Thank you. I'm um, Brad Smith with the American Council of Life Insurers. I, I just wanted to uh, ask you, what, what do you see as the synergies of uh, India's positive economic reforms? And I'm thinking specifically in the insurance space, raising the equity to 74, with your objectives in the G20 to both increase financial inclusion in the market but also to increase funding of long-term investment vehicles, such as infrastructure, you know, other types of sustainable investment. I, just wondering, I mean, the, the advantage of growing an insurance market is you're growing financial protection and you're building long-term capital bases. Through what mechanism in the G20 will these be coordinated? In the past, I understood it was usually a finance and infrastructure working group. And I understand this time you're gonna be fo focusing more on financial inclusion. Will there be a relation between the two? So every, every single action uh, need not be related to a particular working group or a particular track. But broadly, uh, the overall objective of many of the things that you do in the development working group and the development working group is really a group which, on the Sherpa track side, which drives many of these things. Some of these things which have financial implications get driven on the finance track. But in India's case, both Sherpa track, finance track, and engagement tracks will all work towards the same objectives. All of us will work towards the same objective. Now, this issue about insurance is not an issue which is being debated at the G20 level. It's about India. It's about India trying to reform itself and liberalizing further on the insurance policy really to drive a greater level of in insurance inclusion to its population across India. India will continue to accelerate the pace of it. India has done this in digital technology. India has done it in FDI. It was a part of the opening up process of the foreign direct investment regime for insurance. And that is what has happened. And India will continue to liberalize more and more. And that is why FDIs in India have grown ex hugely in the last few years. And we have a very young demographic, so all of them, uh, you know, by in 2047, India's uh, average age will be about 35, almost 90%, 78% of the people will be below the age of 29. So you, all of them will require insurance. That's the future. <laughs> that, that money can also be used for economic good. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, of course, about 90% of the audience for this program is actually uh, watching us online, too, and I've been seeing a few of the comments. One thing that's come up repeatedly talking about international integration is on supply chains. Uh, I wonder how you look at uh, G20. I mean, we've seen, you know, over-reliance on individual countries, whether it's China and others, during COVID and concerns about being able to move goods as we have lockdowns and such. Is the G20 a place also, do you think, for India to talk about, you know, the importance about supply chain diversification? about trade flows, uh, things along those lines, or is that you know best held for other platforms <coughs> and fora? So global supply chains are very important. It's critical uh, because there's over-dependence in one particular country. Uh, but many American companies like Apple, Dell, Cisco, Intel, over-dependence in one country. And therefore, uh, 
there is a need, given the present geopolitics, given the breakdown in supply chains across the world, it's very important for American companies to find alternative places for supply chain. That's not happening fast enough. It's happening in some companies like Apple, but many other companies need to do this much quicker, much faster. Uh, and uh, uh, to my mind, uh, we'll be very happy to work with them, as we've done with Apple, through the production-linked incentive scheme. Uh, we, you need to accelerate the pace. Uh, I think future investments have slowed down, but past investments, you need a greater level of diversification on the supply chain because of security risks and because of the COVID risks. Yeah, great. Hello, I'm um, Rugang Gusari from the Geoeconomic Center at the Atlantic Council. And as you, um, so Brazil and South Africa will be the next two presidents after India of the G20. And this will be the first time that three emerging economies hold the presidency of the four. G20. Indonesia, Indonesia, India, Brazil, yeah. and South Africa. Yeah, four. And uh, so is there any sort of coordination on the agenda over the next three years that you anticipate? Yeah, yeah. We work very closely with Indonesia. We'll work very closely with Brazil, who will take over the presidency from us. And subsequently with South Africa, there's a system called the Troika, which works together. So when India takes over the presidency, the Troika will be Indonesia and Brazil, which will drive this whole movement forward. Great. Yeah. Stephanie. Hello, I'm Stephanie Siegel. I'm with the Economics Program here at CSIS. Um, first, thanks for coming in and talking with us today. Um, it's very clear that um, there's already been a lot of preparation for India's G20 year, um, which is a good thing because, as you've mentioned, it's a very difficult backdrop to make progress, and yet the urgency of the issues in front of us are, are very real. Um, the focus on SDGs and climate, I think, is very welcome. And you've mentioned kind of the, the role of the international financial institutions, the push for reform of those institutions. And recently, there's been a call for an evolution roadmap at the World Bank um, that came out of the annual meetings but was pushed by the G7. Um, it sounds like a lot of those issues are priorities for India in its G20 presidency year. And so I'd be interested to hear about the scope for connection between G7 and G20 on this issue of international financial institutions, but even beyond that, are there mechanisms for coordination? And I guess specifically, Japan will be G20 president while India is, sorry, G7 president while India is G20 president. So I'm wondering if you could say anything about the connections between those two. Thanks. So Japan and India are working together because Japan will hold the uh, G7 presidency. Uh, if you look at the U.S. Treasury Secretary's speech uh, last during the annual conference, uh, that was a clear indicator that the U.S. also wants to push forward for reforms in World Bank and IMF. And I think that's the right course to take, and that's what we've been pressing for for quite some time. You want these institutions to become institutions for really solving many of the challenges of the world, uh, key of which are climate action and SDGs. And uh, that's why uh, both World Bank and IMF would be very critical instruments to achieve uh, prog prosperity on uh, both these areas. And I think the U.S. has come around now to thinking that these are in restructuring them in this manner would be very critical. Uh, one other question that came up uh, quite a few times online. In your opening, you talked uh, on climate side about, you just mentioned green hydrogen briefly. Um, and d do you think the promise is there as big as the hype is right now? And, and what are some of the biggest obstacles you might see to large-scale deployment and development of green, uh, green hydrogen resources globally? And again, you know, is, th is there a role for G20 or is it vested outside places? So uh, green hydrogen, is, uh, it's not the hype. If you want to decarbonize the world, green hydrogen is the way forward. Because, uh, uh, you know, countries which, are, which have the potential for renewable, uh, you can, we do about say 120 gigawatt of renewable. What do you do with more and more, more and more renewables? Electricity is only 20% of your energy. Even if you do 100% electricity, you'll have 80% energy which is not run on electricity, which is run on fossil fuel. You have to decarbonize that. You have to decarbonize refinery, you have to de decarbonize steel, cement, uh, long distance transport, you are not using ele electricity there. So the alternative is that if you are producing renewable, if you keep producing more and more, more and more renewable 
Your grid will not be able to manage it. You'll have a duck curve like you had in California. Your grid will break down. So there are two, two, two things. Either you store electricity and you put it into batteries, 24 into 7 storage. That is still very, very expensive. You need many more technological breakthroughs on the battery storage side. So then you use renewable to crack water, produce green hydrogen to decarbonize all these hard to abate sectors. For that to happen, you have to produce at the cheapest cost from across the world. And that's why the US policy framework needs to encourage green hydrogen from across the world. Great, great. Yeah, Mark. Hi, my name is uh, Mark Linscott. I'm a former longtime USTR trade negotiator and now a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council and a senior advisor at the Asia Group. Um, most of my experience, my most intense experience with G20 was uh, in 2016 uh, during the uh, Chinese presidency. I recognized that uh, the agenda is always huge, plenty of opportunities, um, many challenges. Uh, my specific question is on biofuels. Uh, several months ago, uh, India and Brazil together announced the formation of a biofuels um, alliance and a plan to move that forward in the G20. And I wonder to what extent you are um, planning to reach out to the Biden administration, um, have U.S. leadership um, with you. Uh, the U.S. as the largest producer of biofuels in the world, um, also a significant exporter. Uh, this is an area of economic growth, climate, trade. Um, so it would seem this is um, a perfect opportunity for emerging to join with uh, developed in terms of advancing some G20 um, outcomes? Very, very important question, I must say, and it's a very important remark. We've raised our biofuels from about 1% to about 10% consumption for automobile sector. Uh, we are planning to take it up to 20%. Uh, we're pushing uh, biofuels, but in our case, it's, uh, it's uh, wheat and it's, uh, it's largely sugarcane. It's largely sugarcane. And uh, I think that's one area which, like we are exploring with Brazil, Brazil's gone up to 100% of vehicles being run on biofuel, 100%. I mean, that's remarkable. So we need to work with Brazil, but we need to work with USA in a very big way on biofuel side. There's a massive opportunity there. Great. Thank you. Uh, two more things that have come up uh, looking at social media. And the microphone's open, too, if people have uh, additional things they want to bring up from the room. But uh, one of them, you know, uh, uh, looking at, you know, some of your past experiences on, on tourism. But you got a lot of folks that are going to be coming to India for the first time um, and, and taking the messages back. So when you think about spreading out so many events around the country, and for you who set, played such a critical role in Kerala and nationally on trying to drive, you know, tourism, um, this is a pretty cool opportunity as well to play to one of your personal strengths. Um, how do you merge that as well and, and, and think about, you know, getting as much bang for the buck as you can out of the fact that a whole lot of the world is suddenly going to get exposure to your country that maybe had never had it before? So provide a very unique experience of India and, um, uh, you know, send back uh, every visitor who comes to India during the G20 period. Uh, he should go back uh, spiritually invigorated. Uh, should go back mentally rejuvenated and uh, physically elevated as an Indian. Uh, not as a tourist, but as an Indian. And that's the unique experience in terms of culture, in terms of Ayurveda, in terms of yoga, in terms of meditation that we are putting across and cuisine that we're putting for every single visitor who comes for G20. Mm. Um, the, uh, the last thing that, that popped up was looking at uh, another issue that sometimes is a separation point between developed and developing. And India has been at the, really kind of at the crux of this is looking at immigration. Um, I, it came up again, is, is that an issue too that you think the G20 is an appropriate venue to try to at least you know, further the conversation about allowing a little bit more cross-border cross mobility of labor? Uh, certainly I'm, I'm a huge supporter in trying to see as much of that as possible because gosh, what a, what a binding agent that has been during good times and bad times between our two countries. So uh, G20 immigration, role to play there? A big way. So labor and skill will be a very big way. Uh, big, you know, it'll be a very big area of development in the labor, labor and skill track. And I think uh, it's important that emerging markets will be providing about 
35 to 40 percent of the skilled labor to the developed world in the coming years. And therefore, it's very necessary that they train, provide skills, and ensure that this class of 40 percent of the workforce which will go in the coming years is all trained for the requirement of the developed world of the future. Mm, that's great. Well, uh, I think then, uh, you know, Amitabh, I know you've got an action-packed day, uh, of course, as you engage the United States and less than a month away before uh, India takes over the presidency. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming over to CSIS and spending this much time and answering, I think, 1.8 million questions here today, uh, covering such a, an incredibly wide range of topics. But this is par for the course in the long time that I've been able to, to know you and engage with you. Um, your, your grasp on so many topics is extraordinary, and I can't think of a better person to take over such a critical role as Sherpa for, for the country as you take over the presidency for the G20. So thank you again for coming by, and uh, please join me in uh, thanking Amitabh for being so gracious with his time here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.